Night Sweat by the American poet Robert Lowell first appeared in his sixth poetry collection for the Union Dead in 1964. The poem appears to be autobiographical in nature, with Lowell's speaker describing a period of writer's block, the condition of being unable to think of what to write or how to proceed with writing, which can cause people for whom writing is a profession, a creative outlet or both, extreme anxiety. Lowell's struggles with mental illness throughout his life are the inspiration for a number of his poems, most notably in his fourth collection, Life Studies, and led to critics of the time describing his work as confessional. In the first half of the poem, the speaker describes how for the past ten nights he has been consumed with anxiety and has been unable to write, although it is unclear whether the anxiety has caused the writer's block or vice versa. He spends his nights feverishly tossing and turning, soaked in sweat, tormented by existential worries that rob him of his creative energy. In the second half, he wakes to the morning light, shivering in his clammy, sweat-soaked pyjamas as his nightmares fade away. He sees his wife, her presence seeming to radiate a light that is able to chase away the darkness which oppresses him. He is painfully aware, however, of the strain that this, in its turn, places on her. He finishes the poem, confessing that he may never be able to escape the troubled waters of his anxiety alone. Although Night Sweat has a stream of consciousness feel, with the speaker reporting his thoughts and feelings as he experiences them in a seemingly unorganised and unstructured manner, it is, nevertheless, deceptively both highly organised and highly structured. The poem is 28 lines long and comprises a Shakespearean sonnet followed by a Petrarchan sonnet. The two sonnets split the poem into two halves, with the first half focusing on Lowell's night sweats and his feverish and nightmarish sense of isolation and anxiety, while the second half shifts to the morning, when he wakes to clammy cold pyjamas, daylight and the reassuring presence of his wife. Sonnets are 14 lines long and have a base metre of iambic pentameter, didum, 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 didum although Lowell does substitute trochees, dum-dee, spondees, dum-dum, and pyrrhics, diddy, as well as modulating the rhythm with extensive enjambment, caesura, dashes, ellipses, and exclamations. The 14 lines in a Shakespearean sonnet are divided into three quatrains and a rhyming couplet and Lowell's rhyme scheme for this part of the poem follows an A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G pattern. The 14 lines in a Petrarchan sonnet, on the other hand, are divided into an octave, eight lines, and a sestet, six lines. And Lowell's rhyme scheme for this part of the poem follows an A, B, A, B, C, D, D, C, E, F, G, G, F, E pattern. As well as masculine or single end rhyme, Lowell employs extensive alliteration, such as sweet salt and light, lighten my leaded eyelids. Consonants, such as creeping damp, and assonance, such as glide and bias of existing rings us dry, which he interweaves to create a poem of muted musicality. The title, Night Sweat, refers to periods of extreme sweating that often soaks through nightclothes and bedding, even when the external environment is cool. The poem begins with a description of the speaker's physical surroundings, which may be a study or perhaps even a corner of a bedroom, and merely contains a list of the objects within it. 
work table, litter, books and standing lamp. The fact that he describes a work table rather than a desk, and that this is the very first thing he mentions, immediately suggests to the reader that the poem is going to be about his identity as a writer. The word litter evokes screwed up bits of paper containing notes or perhaps discarded drafts of poems. In the second line, the list continues. Plain things, my stalled equipment, the old broom. But this time with the addition of adjectives that all have negative connotations, such as plain, stalled and old, and immediately hint at a gloomy state of mind. The equipment a writer uses is a pen or perhaps a typewriter, but this, for Lowell, has stalled or come to an unintended halt, implying that he is undergoing a period of writer's block where he is unable to create anything. The old broom is also there, perhaps standing in the corner, waiting to be used to sweep up the papers that he has thrown to the floor. Note that this part of the list is also asyndetic, in that there is no coordinating conjunction and. This, in conjunction with the irregularity of the rhythm caused by the substitution of three spondees, dum-dum, and a pyrrhic, didi, in these lines, which disrupts the iambic pentameter, as well as the three dashes at the end, creates a disjointed feel to evoke the speaker's disordered mental state, i.e. work table, litter, books and standing lamp, plain things, my stalled equipment, the old broom. He continues, but I am living in a tidied room. The coordinating conjunction but here suggests that the adjective tidied, which usually has positive connotations, has anything but that for him, symbolising as it does a lack of the paper mess, which is the byproduct of the creative process. He has for ten nights now felt the creeping damp float over my pyjamas wilted white. For the past week and a half, he says, he has been troubled by night sweats, which have caused his pyjamas to become limp the adjective creeping to describe the onset of the dampness of the sweat and the verb float suggest an unrelenting and ominous stealthiness, which is also further enhanced by the ellipsis at the end of the line. The unpleasantness of this sensation is evoked by the consonants of the plosive p in creeping damp, the alliteration and consonants of the plosive t in wilted white. He continues, sweet salt embalms me and my head is wet. Everything streams and tells me this is right. My life's fever is soaking in night sweat. Note the way in which the speaker uses seemingly contradictory language here to perhaps evoke the way in which he feels caught in a paradoxical situation. That his life's fever or his all-consuming passion to write and his depression, anxiety and night sweat, the cause of his writer's block, are two sides of the same coin, each unable to exist without the other. First of all, there's an oxymoron, sweet salt, to describe how the sweat embalms him and soaks his head. The verb to embalm has two meanings both of which would be appropriate in the context here, with the first and more generally used one of mummifying or preserving a corpse, while the second is an archaic usage to communicate the way in which something gives off a sweet fragrance. If we think about the way in which his white pyjamas are also drenched in sweat and perhaps cling to him like the wrappings of a mummy, we can imagine that he feels as though he is in terms of his creative output, a corpse. And yet his use of the adjective sweet perhaps signifies how he feels more positively towards the fever which produces the sweat, as everything streams and tells me this is right. 
even though it seems to be symptomatic of something which is terribly wrong. He begins the next line with the exclamation, One life, one writing. This example of parallel syntax, which gives equal weight to the words life and writing, making them one and the same, seems to communicate the extent to which he feels his whole identity is bound up with his passion. Writing isn't what he does, but what he is. The caesura pulls the reader up sharply, forcing them to pause, and the coordinating conjunction but suggests that he is going to explore in more detail the obstacles he faces. But the downward glide and bias of existing rings us dry. Here he seems to be alluding to his depression and anxiety. The whole experience of existing, of living, seems to pull him downward into despair. The verb glide suggesting a movement with a smooth and continuous motion. If something has a bias, it has a strong leaning or inclination towards something, which suggests that, for Lowell's speaker at least, this downward movement is a fundamental and inescapable part of existence and saps us, or wrings us dry, of our creative energy, presumably in our attempt to fight it. Note the interweaved assonance of the long I sounds here in glide, bias and dry. The sibilance of bias, existing, rings and us. The consonance of the D sounds in downward, glide and dry, as well as the internal rhyme of existing and rings, which all seem to enhance the regular iambic dum rhythm of these lines, evoking what he feels to be an unrelenting descent. The anaphora in the lines Always inside me is the child who died, always inside me is his will to die, communicates the way in which dark thoughts seem to plague him without respite. It's unclear who the child is to whom he refers metaphorically here, but it evokes a sense of vulnerability, fragility and fear, perhaps of the creative potential which has not been realised and which seems to have a death wish. Lowell's use of parallel syntax returns in the next line with one universe, one body, as he once more ponders the nature of his existence and communicates his feeling of being constrained by its finiteness. The lines, In this urn the animal night sweats of the spirit burn, conclude the first sonnet and sum up his nocturnal struggles. This urn is a metaphor for his body which is consumed with heat. The way in which he describes his night sweats as animal suggests that they are brutish and wild. The tone and focus of the second half of the poem shifts abruptly as the second sonnet begins with two exclamations. Behind me, you. The first of which appears to be a command, with the verb get implied, and seems to allude to Jesus' exclamation reported in Matthew, verse 16, chapter 23. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Here, Lowell seems to be attempting to cast out these intrusive thoughts that hinder him by making him obsess over his existential worries, rather than concentrating on his higher calling, which is his writing. Morning has arrived as I feel the light lighten my leaded eyelids. The adjective leaded just means like lead and suggests the heavy tiredness in his eyes after ten nights without restful sleep. The verb lighten here seems to refer more to an absence of darkness rather than of weight as the alliterated light lighten and leaded with the liquid l sound also picked up in eyelid, as well as the plosive d 
and t sounds create a ponderous feel. With the coming of the morning, the grey skulled horses whinny for the soot of night. This metaphor, which is almost Shakespearean in its allusions to death and dirty darkness, characterising the frightening thoughts which haunt him as menacing and nightmarish creatures that only retreat at daybreak. He continues, I dabble in the dapple of the day. The verb to dabble means to partially submerge your hands or feet in water and move them around gently. And if something is dappled, it is marked with spots or round patches. Lowell here builds a picture of coming to full consciousness slowly as he stirs his body in a room which now has patches or flecks of sunlight in it. Note the way in which dabble and dapple are near identical in sound. The initial d picked up in the alliterated day at the end of the line, which seems to enhance the sense of returning calm. He is, however, a heap of wet clothes, seamy, shivering. The heap that has caused his night sweats has evaporated, leaving him clammy and cold. The sibilance of seamy, shivering, enhancing this unpleasant sensation. The way in which he sees my flesh and bedding washed with light suggests the cleansing nature of the daylight which removes the soot of night and causes him to see the negativity embodied in his inner child exploding into dynamite. His gaze then turns to his wife. She possesses a metaphorical likeness which alters everything and tears the black web from the spider's sack. Once more, Lowell's nightmarish vision seemed to take the form of threatening creatures which wrap him up and imprison him in a black web. Note the harsh sound patterning in this line with the plosive b sound in black web, the hissing sibilance of spider's sack, and the guttural internal rhyme of black and sack, which reinforce his feeling of torment. The mere presence of his wife is able to tear away this sense of menace as her heart hops and flutters like a hare, this simile suggesting a gentle strength and sense of pureness. In the final quatrain, Lowell addresses her directly. Poor turtle, tortoise, if I cannot clear the surface of these troubled waters here, absolve me. Help me, dear heart, as you bear this world's dead weight and cycle on your back. In this image, Lowell seems to be alluding to the world or cosmic turtle, a mytheme from Hindu, Chinese and indigenous American mythologies of a giant turtle or tortoise which supports the world on its back. If he is unable to metaphorically clear the surface of these troubled waters by himself, or pull himself up out of this period of anxiety and depression, he asks her first for her forgiveness, absolve me, and then for her support, help me, dear heart, as he acknowledges that she bears this world's dead weight and cycle on her back. In other words, he is painfully aware that now he is like this and shall be again. Note that it is a cycle, or a state of affairs which comes and goes. He is a burden that she has to carry emotionally, which can only take a terrible toll on her as well. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.